Welcome to the Homesteaders of America podcast, where we encourage simple living, hard work, natural health care, real food, and building an agrarian society. If you're pioneering your way through modern noise and conveniences, and you're an advocate for living a more sustainable and quiet life, this podcast is for you. Welcome to this week's podcast. I'm your host, Amy Fuel, and I'm the founder of the Homesteaders of America organization and annual events. If you're not familiar with us, we are a resource for homesteading education and online support, and we even host a couple of in-person events each year, with our biggest annual event happening right outside the nation's capital here in Virginia every October. Check us out online at homesteadersofamerica.com, follow us on all of our social media platforms, and subscribe to our newsletter so that you can be the first to know about all things HOA, that's short for Homesteaders of America. Don't forget that we have an online membership that gives you access to thousands, yes, literally thousands of hours worth of information and videos. It also gets you discount codes, an HOA decal sticker when you sign up, and access to event tickets before anyone else. All right, let's dive into this week's episode. Welcome back to this week's episode of the Homesteaders of America podcast. I am really excited to have guest John Lovell with me from Warrior Poet Society. Welcome to the podcast, John. Thanks for having me on, Amy. Yeah. If you guys don't know, John will tell you guys a little bit about himself. Um, but John has been a speaker for the last couple of years for HOA events. And he is an author. And he normally talks about security at our events, which we'll talk a little bit about today. He just has a lot of stuff going on that's not even normally like on the radar for homesteaders, right? But it absolutely should be, which is why we invited you to HOA. So, John, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Sure. My wife and I were reluctant homesteaders. It wasn't in our purview. We didn't grow up around animals or farm, property, land. I grew up kind of in suburbia. And when I saw certain indices socioeconomically a few years back, go awry, uh, me as a freedom-loving individual realized ultimately the only way to secure freedom from overreaching government institutions is through self-sufficiency and autonomy, which meant going back to what people have been doing for ages, forever, until recent cities, and that's homesteading. The problem is, is after we bought some land, we realized we knew jack squat. We we knew nothing. We had less than zero skills. And so we really started at the basement and we wanted to learn, hey, how do we do this homesteading stuff? We want to grow some food. And then we got some chickens and chickens were great fun. Didn't know how fun they'd be to just watch chickens. So yeah, we got chickens and that went well. And then we added some cows, some beef cows, and then now we're horses and alpacas and, you know, we're growing stuff and uh, we're off grid and uh, we're a few years down into the homesteading movement. And we have a whole bunch of the homesteaders, the folks that people look up to that are tuning into this podcast. We learn from them. And so it was out of that appreciation that the homesteading world would accept us, which didn't go to it for the typical means that a lot of people do. And that's, Hey, they want a healthier lifestyle, which is absolutely true. They want to be, uh, out of screens and the mundane and kind of shopping at grocery stores and to be able to, whatever reason people get into the homesteading movement, we felt real accepted by the community and I wanted to be able to give back. So, um, I have a unique skill set. I was a former special operations guy. I, work in security. I teach rifle and pistol classes. I teach tactics classes. I want to make the world a safer place. And I really don't like evil people using violence to hurt innocents. And so that's our whole gig is we want to be able to be forces for good, to be able to protect people because we love people. And so we saw the homesteader uh, community and we wanted to give back and uh, that's kind of brings us up to speed. Did, that, did I answer that? Yeah, you did. Okay. You did. You answered it very well. Um, you have a book, right? Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. It's the Warrior Poet Way. We are the Warrior Poet Society. It's a values-based community. So we revolve around an ethic. We live for higher purpose and we're ready to sacrifice in the defense of others. And so part of that is a physical security aspect. Others is defending truth ideals. And so ideologically, we're freedom fighters motivated by love for our fellow man. We want to be protectors of the innocent. And so that's the idea. 
And so in our pursuit to hold up the ideals of both the warrior, someone who's uh, bold and strong and long suffering and has grit and is willing to sacrifice in the defense of others and is skilled in arms. We wanted to embody the archetypical warrior, but also the poet. And that's somebody who can be romantic, who is philosophically and emotionally deep waters, that's successful in relationships, that appreciates awe inspiring beauty and wonderment and be able to think hard about the things that matter and have good philosophy and good theology. Uh, we want both. And so that's a matter of balance. And it doesn't happen accidentally. Typically, people wax into one of the two archetypes, which leads to, leads to an unbalanced life. And so The Warrior Poet Way, my book, is able to help those who are naturally predisposed to be more lions become a little bit more lamb so that you're both and not either or. And those who are a little bit more err on the side of passivity that are more lambs would become more lions so that we can appreciate both of the strengths. And so the book really gets deep down into the nitty gritty rubber meets road of how do we grow as lions and lambs. I love that so much. That's amazing. It's, it's really nice to see more men getting into home study because when we first started HOA, it was mostly just women and they were all like, how do we get our husbands on board with homesteading? And so we were constantly being asked by other women, like, how do you convince your husband to come? And so funny enough, uh, my husband actually watched Warrior Poet Society YouTube channel for quite some time before I even knew who John was. And uh, he's like, you know what? If you got John Lovell to come, then that's a conference I'd go to. <laughs> And he's like, I bet more men would go too. And so that's exactly what happened. The first year that we had John come, we actually had so many women that were like, the only reason I'm here is because my husband wants to come see John Lovell. And so it's a, it's a win-win, which is pretty incredible. So um, we've really enjoyed having you and your wife with us. Your wife is a plethora of information too. And we really enjoy mingling with her at events. But so John, you talk a lot about homestead security. Uh, at our events. And we don't obviously have hours of time to talk about it, but I wonder if you might give us maybe like your top three things that you would tell homesteaders as the world's getting a little bit more crazy. What are some things that they could do to help secure their homesteads? Some of this would be intuitive to a lot of folks that are gaining strides toward self-sufficiency. I also noticed there's a uh, a great amount of people in the homesteading movement that are, they are sweet uh, to say it the best and naive to say it the worst. And that I want to imagine that the world is a sweeter, calmer, nicer place than it really is. Right. And what I fear as our economic structures, our supply chain, our power grid, everything is a lot more fragile than people really understand. There is an author, I'm blanking on the name, who first coined this, but it'll be, it'll be well known. And that's, we're always nine meals from anarchy. And the idea is, is everybody in America generally on average holds about three days of food, three meals, three days, nine meals away from anarchy. And that means if your family has no food because supply chains have uh, come to a grinding halt or power grid fails, or some type of socioeconomic collapse, some type of revolution, some type of societal unrest, which made it unsafe to be able to go expeditionary to get groceries or go into town and do whatever. What wouldn't you do to feed your family? What wouldn't you do if you saw your family without food? And if you imagine that over a longer period of time, days spread into weeks, spread into months, people could become quite desperate and bad players wanting to take from the innocent could really jeopardize you and the livelihood of other people. Now, it's not our stuff that I'm interested in protecting. It's our people. But in such a downgrid socioeconomic collapsing structure or societal unrest in such a scenario, people cannot survive without their stuff. If you don't have food, guess what? Now it's just a slow attrition and a starvation. If you don't have access to water, if you don't have access to energy, it's the winter and you can't heat your home. 
deaths around the country skyrocket when that kind of things happen. And so we want to be able to protect our resources because we love people and we want to be able to protect people. And so I want to be able to give people tools so that they can make small steps to make their home and then their homestead more defensible in such a scenario that any type of energy or food, water, any supplies becomes scarce you know, demand goes up and supply is eviscerated. People who have ill intentions will go expeditionary. They'll be looking for uh, ways to be able to take what you have. And so if you understand how precariously a lot of our structures truly are, you'll realize security is your most important preparation. It's not the food. It's not all the stuff. Ultimately, if you're preparing for some type of apocalyptic event to say it at worst, but hey, how about just bad times in the future to say it uh, even more plausibly to a lot of the listeners out there? Uh, if you are not able to secure your uh, things, your lifestyle, your home, then you're really just preparing for someone else. Someone else will take what you have. Someone like me, I can... I can look at homesteads and I'll be like, I'll take everything you have in an afternoon and there's nothing you can do to stop me. Um, and that's for me. That's because of what I know. Some paramilitary guys will be that way and some folks that are are not controlled by certain ethics and, and, and a theological Christian worldview that I am, uh, you know, marauders start to arise. And this sounds all too fantastic to a lot of people of like, oh, because it hasn't happened lately, it will not happen at all. It's an inductive reasoning, not recognizing that in the scheme of empires, America is a kind of a new kid on the block. All the ancient empires have all gone by the wayside. No nation sits secure. And make no mistake, all the nations that sit se secure seemingly now will one day be swept away and replaced by other structures. We are in the decline of our civilization right now, and it's speeding up at an alarming rate. So I, I tell people, have the courage to read the writing on the wall and buckle up. Bad times are ahead. Yeah. You know, one of the things that we have noticed over the last couple of years is there are a lot more military folks that are joining the homesteading community. And so I know like for us personally, there's a large um, community here of either retired military or um, people who work in government contracting or special forces types of contractors and, and military and ex-military. And so we're seeing that and we really started seeing it maybe four years ago. And one of the things that they, they do tell people is they stress the security. And it's, it's interesting because, you know, you as being ex-military and doing what you do, you see things differently. You can see something in the media and think well, automatically, well, I know what that is. That's a war tactic or, or that's something else that common citizens wouldn't understand. And so as things do start happening in the world, you know, what are some maybe some alerts? Like what are some things that people as if right now isn't enough, right? Like there's so many red flags now, but um, especially rural people, because I know a lot of rural people, they don't necessarily watch the news all the time. They don't necessarily read a lot of newspapers. That's probably one of the downfalls. And it's the blessing and the curse of homesteading, right? You want to live a simple life, but sometimes you're oblivious. So what are some things that you might anticipate happening, some warning flags happening in America that can alert people things are really starting to get bad and maybe even tomorrow might be 10 times worse? Sure. So if you're not noticing any signs currently, you're just not paying attention. Right. We just had Thanksgiving. Three years ago, it was illegal in major cities to eat dinner with your family. It was illegal. They could arrest you and send you to jail for eating a Thanksgiving meal with your family. What kind of totalitarian control is that? They literally shut down the churches for a couple years in place in the UK and Canada, you tweet the wrong thing and you will go to jail for it. Uh, so there is infringements on First Amendment, uh, certainly on the Second Amendment, and, and every piece of the First Amendment, too. That's the right to assemble. That was absolutely just uh, completely jeopardized and still, you know, uh, it, that that's still very, very fresh. Uh, your freedom of religion was jeopardized. Freedom of the press, most of the press is just bought up. 
billionaire pawns. They're owned by private entities yeah. who have already shown themselves to have an anti-American agenda of the freedom of speech, obviously under attack. And the Second Amendment, uh, right to bear arms, that is constantly under attack, and they've gained some humongous ground over the last 50 years as well. And so you see the underpinnings, the foundation that our country sits on, the Constitution undermined at every turn, and at an alarming rate is getting worse. You also see a degradation in things like our supply chain, where Remember the big toilet paper scare when mm -hmm. people were freaking out because they weren't sure whether they'd have resources and there's just this crazy run on toilet paper and you couldn't get it anywhere. And I remember different uh, grocery stores just emptying out of some basic and essential goods. And that's happened a couple of times over the last decade. I've also seen gas station lines just out, you know, of like people waiting in line and then they run out of gas and all you've got is what you've got. And so you've seen little clues uh, around that bad times are coming. And so if that stuff doesn't wake you up, if you're not seeing some of the totalitarian power games that are happening right now, if you're not seeing runaway inflation, regardless of what propagandistic media is reporting, we are in double digit inflation. Uh, that, that is terrible economic woes, and it is getting worse, not better. Wishful thinking isn't going to make it go away. And so if you just look at the normal trends, you should be doing things to become more self-sufficient and autonomous and in investing in renewable energy sources and different assets, uh, be able to uh, make sure your skills are going up. Remember, I was, I was really scared, so to speak, into the homesteading world. I didn't arrive there by default. I'm a guy who saw the writing on the wall had the courage to at least recognize what it was and take advantage of the freedom I currently possess to make sure I can grow in freedom, which means I've got land, I've got water, I've got food, I've got energy, and I don't need the government's permission. If they shut my bank account off, we can, we can eke by. If the grocery stores close, we can survive. If the power grid goes down, we can be okay. Uh, if, if no one can heat their home, we can still heat our home. And so that makes me very difficult to bully. Uh, I don't have to choose between, uh, following a totalitarian socialist law, uh, and feeding my family. I don't have to choose between those two. And so I think people need to really wake up and it requires, I think at its core, it requires some courage to be able to see the world as it is, not as you wish it to be. Right. Hey guys, thanks for joining us for this week's episode. We're going to take a quick break and bring you a word from one of our amazing sponsors. McMurray Hatchery officially started in 1917. Murray McMurray had always been interested in poultry as a young man and particularly enjoyed showing birds at the local and state fairs. Nowadays, the hatchery is still completely through mail order, but they offer way more than ever before. From meat chicks and layer hens to waterfowl, ducklings, goslings, turkeys, game birds, juvenile birds. They even have hatching eggs and a whole lot of chicken equipment. Make sure you check out our Home Center of America sponsor, McMurray Hatchery at mcmurrayhatchery.com and get your orders in today. And don't forget to stop by their booth at the 2023 HOA event. Yeah, and one of the things I think we find too, especially in Christianity, is we know that the Lord's going to take care of us, right? We know that he has us, but also there's maybe some lack of wisdom in preparation, like we see this a lot in home studying, especially that people will put off security or prepping or taking care of their family now and just expect the Lord to be the only one who takes care of them. Right. But people like you are teaching, like it's good to have wisdom to navigate life in a new world that you weren't expecting to live in. And so as you teach that, what's one thing that you typically find with people who, who come to your classes or, or even at Homesteaders of America, I'm sure you get a ton of questions there. What's probably the most popular question in regard to homestead security that you get on a regular basis? So you said two things there. One was leaning in a little bit to a theology of preparation and self-sufficiency. And the other mm -hmm. one was the most common question I get. So I'll take the very first one. I think some of the lack of preparation people take 
uh, they'll excuse it as if it's a matter of faith, like I have faith and therefore I will not make future provision for my family. It's just really bad theology. It's it's lazy at best, and at worst, it's a terrible, terrible read on theology. By the exact mm-hmm. same logic, you'd say, oh, I was commanded by Jesus in Matthew 28 to go and make disciples of all nations, but God will save who he's going to save, so no need to do evangelism. It's the same crappy argument of like, mm-hmm. no, even though God could, he's called you to do it. Yeah. God could provide for your family, but men, he called for you to provide for the family as he provides through you and for you. It's not mm-hmm. an either or, it's a both and. When it comes to security, there's a, a an interesting um, verse in the book of Proverbs where it says, ready the horse for battle, but the victory lies with the Lord. Right. And so I'm like, we're still supposed to ready for battle. We're sp- still supposed to do training and saddle up the horse and get ready and then go to war and do the thing. There's a time mm-hmm. for peace and a time for war. Ecclesiastes three says there's a time to plant and a time to harvest as well. Same chapter of Ecclesiastes three. And so there is a time for both. But you can even look at some of the meta narratives that were uh, crafted in the Old Testament, which were a foreshadowing even to maybe some futuristic times. But Israel was headed toward a total famine of the land. God, knowing this was coming, had Joseph sold into slavery by his brothers. They counted him for dead. Little did he know he was rising up the ranks in the Egyptian government to become number two in charge. Then in a dream, he found out that a famine was coming. No one's got any food. Their supply chains are failing. Their crops are failing. Government control. And so uh, he was able to store up years and years of food, self-sufficiency, preparations. And it was through him, his preparation, that Israel was saved. The people of God were saved. Perhaps God wants you to do the same thing. You have been named as the provider of your family. Second Timothy says those who do not provide for the needs of his family have denied the faith and are worse than an unbeliever. So Christian, you provide for your family. And if you think dark days are ahead, then provide even harder. Yeah. Don't wimp out and be like, nope, the, God's going to take care of it. No, God has sent you to take care of that uh, as well. And he's going to work through your efforts. But we got to do stuff. Real faith works. So that's how yeah. I'd answer that before I jump into the the next question. You got anything to say? I kind of went on a tirade there. I love it. I So I've actually asked a couple of people that on the podcast and they have never explained it as well as you just did. So I loved that you threw those verses in there and they spot on. Um, and so I 100% agree with you. Actually, I wrote um, about the Joseph story in the HOA program uh, at this year's conference. And it's something that we talk about a lot. And we actually spoke about it at the women's event too, that we just had in November. And so we, we truly believe like every event that I do, I often say that um, I feel like the home study movement carries the Joseph mantle because we are born for such a time as this. It is, it's the way we're living to take care of ourselves, our family, our, our friends, our neighbors. And we'll get into that in a second about taking care of your neighbors, but go ahead and feel free to answer that second question. So the most common questions I get are usually about, hey, what type of firearm should I be getting? That That's, I think, the most common. So, uh, and people have different contexts because I need a follow-up question immediately. What are you defending a homestead with is not necessarily the same as what do you defend a home with? And what you defend a home with is not necessarily what you're carrying in public. And so it's all different mm-hmm. answers. And so yeah. I'd need a follow-up question on that as well. But I'm quick to add that, hey, you don't just go out and get a gun. You, you do some training as well. Training is important. It is critical. It is more important than what hardware you're packing. As I say, it is mm-hmm. the Indian, not the arrow. Uh, yeah. So somebody who is trained with an inferior type of firearm can crush somebody who's got the Gucciest, whatever, high dollar <laughs> thing you want to go of like, man... Give me a little snub rose revolver and you get whatever you want. And I'm still going to win right. in a room clearing fight against an untrained person. Right. So um, anyway, it's the Indian, not the arrow. And so uh, there you go. Yeah. Okay. So um, one of the things that you talked about last year at HOA, and I think you probably touched on it this year too, 
was about kind of building a community around you. It's not necessarily just you and your fortress, but building like-minded people around you. And so how could you, how could one do that? I mean, we talk about a lot of HOA, but how would someone like you do that? Because I imagine you're very selective in who you let in your inner circles and I know a lot of homesteaders are finding new friends and trying to build trust with new people in their community. What's the best way to go about building a community around you? Sure. I think security is the most important preparation because it's the only thing that keeps all your preparations in your possession and keeps you and your loved ones alive to enjoy it. It's like the First Amendment of our Constitution. It's the most important. It's all our freedoms. And then the Second Amendment is there, right to bear arms, because it's the only thing that allows you to keep the First Amendment. And so similarly, security is you, the prep that allows all of your other preparations in your homestead to continue to exist. Now, that being said, a lot of people are like, oh, well, what do I do? And they're looking for a quick check the block security thing as if they're going to go out, buy a gun, and now you're good to go. And that is a wild oversimplification of a difficult problem. It is is a certainly not a not that easy, especially mm -hmm. if the context were really bad. Now, the the worse the kind of fallout gets, if you imagine some type of absolute socioeconomic collapse with no end in sight, where it's kind of like one second after, months go by and resources and systems and institutions of power are not replenishing stores. And it's just you against the world. The only way you'll be able to keep an actual homestead is through multiple families living on that one homestead. It can't be just you, the misses, and a couple kiddos against the world. And so th this is where I have some experience in that I was an army ranger. What we did abroad in my five combat tours is we'd take land and we would keep land. That's what we, we would do. And uh, though we weren't protecting crops and things like that, we had not, not homesteads, but they were kind of like compounds, series of houses behind enemy lines in enemy territory where all the people around us wanted to kill us. And so we go in, we take that land and then we live in that land and keep it and run operations out of it. So, I mean, uh, this is not theory for me. This is something I did, you know, tour after tour after tour operating really behind enemy lines with minimal support sometime in very small units. And so it, it's very similar. And so you have to apply the same age old small unit tactics to be able to keep land uh, from those who want to take it. And that means roaming security positions that set up in key terrain pieces with interlocking sectors of fire. And you have standard operating procedures of how you're greeting people that want to penetrate your perimeter, whether they be friendly seeking a handout or they're posing as friendlies, but they're really gathering intel for a greater force to be able to probe your perimeter and be able to get in or take people captive or be able to roll over and uh, take everything you got. And again, the point isn't to keep all the stuff from everyone else. The point is to keep everyone alive. But if you have no food, that is just a slow death, death sentence for everyone. And you don't know what those marauders would want. Maybe they're just going to come in and kill everyone. I had a couple of years ago, I did my very first homesteading event and I made a mistake. I thought, I thought because of the just electrified audience, everyone was so pumped up and rallied. I thought of like, oh, these are my people. But what I didn't know is inside the homestead community is a lot of really, really sweet people who are a little bit more, uh, I don't mean it in a condescending way. They're a little more granola. They're right. a little bit more hippie. Yeah. They're a little more pacifistic. And so some of these, particularly the pacifistic men who understand provision of a family, but they have completely abdicated all protection of their family as if that's not something that they would ever have to do, that you know, they are not doing what men should actually be doing. And instead, what they do is they attack men who make them, who highlight and underscore that they are not doing manly responsibilities. Right. You're not leading your family like a man. And so I had one YouTuber in particular really uh, craft a, a real straw man argument. He, he dealt very deceptively of what I said to build in who I was and what I represented as something that was frankly just not true. 
It was not true. And his idea was, is kind of the old idea of like, well, don't build a higher fence, build a bigger table. Right. Uh, that, that's the same ideology that says open up the U.S. border. No reason to close that. It's a beta pacifistic idea that allows, uh, that is weak men, that allows uh, everything to be taken uh, by those who wish harm. It, it is a dangerous ideology. And so that was something I wasn't really ready for. Uh, but I, I would say just, hey, in love, we care about people and I care about security because I love people. I want to defend people. And if something bad happened, I would hate to see everything that you've built that's meant to safeguard, protect and nourish those you love be taken from you in a bad yeah. afternoon. Yeah. And that's one thing we have to stress to people here, especially in our own little community that we have here is that you can't trust everybody. Not everyone is your friend. Not even now. I mean, we've we we know enough now just through people that we know in the government and military folk when people are probing for questions, right? When they just want to know what you have and what you have to offer and what you're doing. And so we learned really early that you can't trust every person that is just in your community or in your homesteading community specifically, just because everyone wants to have chickens and everyone wants to grow food. Just like you said, John, there are people who they're like not even remotely wanting to secure their homesteads. And they're going to be the ones who want to come to your property and say, Hey, I need food from you, you know, like, and feel entitled to it. And so it's just really interesting to see the the differences in the homesteading community. And that's why one of the reasons we love having you is because you bring a different perspective and a right perspective because it's something everyone needs to hear. It's not just something one group of homesteaders needs to hear. It's something everyone needs to hear. And so we really appreciate the work that you do and, and all of the things that that you talk about on your YouTube channel too, I know it's not necessarily homesteading related for those of you who are interested, although I have noticed you've posted more homesteading and stuff, but it's really good information. And so you mentioned training. Um, I wonder if you talk about that a little bit, what you do, how you, how you train, not necessarily how you train others, but what options are there for people who are listening to this podcast if they wanted to take any of your training? Sure. Well, we do in-person training. And so our Warrior Poet website has... All of our classes posted, and every, it's everything from entangled gun and blade fighting to rifle stuff to uh, room clearing. And there's a whole gamut of just different classes, medical classes. We're really big on medical. You're more likely to rescue somebody with a tourniquet and some medical know-how than you are with a gun. And our big idea, the reason I carry a gun every single day of my life is to safeguard life. That, that's the whole point. And that means some active killer wants to shoot up a school or a restaurant or someplace that I am at. I'm like, well, not on my watch. I'm going to defend and protect innocent life by putting that joker down immediately. I've got the skill set and I've got the tools to be able to do it. I am a protector. I am a mobile safe space. And so that's why I carry a gun everywhere. I carry a medical kit everywhere I go as well in mm -hmm. case something went wrong. I'm ready to protect and safeguard. And so we have physical in-person classes. What's probably easiest for folks in the community without getting into a class is to just be able to sign on to our network. Our network is a streaming service. You can visit it at watchwpsn.com. That's watchwpsn.com. And on there, the Warrior Poet Society Network, we, we go through all the different classes We've put them up digitally so you can kind of try it before you visit. And so full pistol one class where we get in the weeds on all the stuff as an introduction to pistol. Even guys who have had guns their whole lives learn massive amounts. I've been told over and over by it. And so being able to tune in online, well, it, you can get it in the app store and Android or iOS or Apple TV, uh, uh, Roku. We're on all the places. It's WPSN. And so that, that's a good easy way where you can start kind of poking around and seeing what we're doing. Yeah. And you guys, if you want to listen to John's full lecture from the, the past couple of years, we actually have all of those lectures up on our HOA membership. And so you can just go to homesteadersofamerica.com and sign up for either the VIP or premier membership. And you can watch all of his lectures from the past that he's had at our events. If you want to learn more about homestead security, that is the best place to get it. And um, we kind of covered a bunch of different little things in this podcast episode, um, but you can check out his YouTube channel, his website, like he mentioned, 
and then the HOA membership where you can listen to all of these lectures and all the information that you'd like to collect there. So John, thank you for joining me this week. I wonder if there's anything else burning inside of you that you'd like to share with our audience. This is always the best time because like people will share something completely off the wall. That is amazing. So what, what might you have to tell our community before we get off here? Well, I was going to say no, but then you said, this is always the, and I don't want to be the, I don't want to be the guy that says, uh, I got nothing. I'm like, I don't know. I just really enjoyed hanging out with you and answering questions and, uh, I, I really like the homesteading community. Uh, I think personally, because I just have gleaned so much of it, it was yeah. completely foreign to us a few years ago when we first started and we've covered some major ground by just doing one little thing at a time. I got to go close up my beehives tonight for the winter. Uh, cause it'll get down in the twenties tonight here in Georgia. And so I haven't done that yet. And some of you homesteaders will be like, why haven't you done that yet? I'm like, because I suck <laughs> at homesteading, man. That's why, you newbie. <laughs> but I'm doing it. I'm doing the things I've been learning and growing. And so, um, I'm just grateful to the homestead community. And, uh, for those who are, uh, really, really have a problem with me ideologically understand, uh, love me or hate me. I, I am in your mm -hmm. corner. I'm trying to tell you something that I see as clear as the nose on your face. And so, um, I, I do hope that some folks will just take a few small steps into making their home and themselves a little bit safer. Yeah. Awesome, John. Well, thank you guys for joining us for this week's episode, all the show notes and information that John talked about and that we talked about are below either the podcast or the YouTube channel, whichever you're watching on. You can also find the transcript on our website, homesteadersofamerica.com. And until next time, happy homesteading. Hey, thanks for taking the time to listen to this week's Homesteaders of America episode. We really enjoyed having you here. We welcome questions and you can find the transcript and all the show notes below or on our Homesteaders of America blog post that we have up for this podcast episode. Don't forget to join us online with a membership or just to read blog posts and find out more information about our events at homesteadersofamerica.com. We also have a YouTube channel and follow us on all of our social media accounts to find out more about homesteading during this time in American history. All right, have a great day and happy homesteading. <music>